Welcome to episode 9 of Cyberbytes the Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Cooper, co-founder of Aspiron Search. Today's guest, we have CISA No Name Security, Carl Matson. We talk about his love for API security and the three main areas needed to protect your APIs. And we finish off with some great advice for CISOs looking to work for cybersecurity startups. How are you, mate? Fantastic. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, really well, thank you. Really, really well. I know we, uh, when I first got in touch with you at Cybertech New York, wasn't it? I think you was uh, presenting at that particular one. Um, well, I was a passenger in New York and I presented in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv. And then I met you face to face in Tel Aviv. So no, it's, it's good to good to connect over Zoom, Carl. Um, so yeah, really, really keen to, to take it right back to where it all began. So running, I, th- I guess we can start from your military days and just run run through it from there, really. Yeah. Um, uh, for high school, I, I, I did a very, very uh, short, uh, unsuccessful tour through college. Uh, dropped out and and uh, and joined the army because I, I didn't know I didn't have anything else uh, I wanted to do. So that was the 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 right move. And uh, about ten years uh, working with NSA, uh, both as like uniformed military and then also as a civilian. Um, and so yeah, I was getting close to thirty and I decided I, I needed to um, you know go, go to my next career. And so we kind of entered the uh, IT and IT security space in the in the commercial world. And it was. Now just about 20 years and most of that time i've spent in financial services uh eventually getting the first couple of CISO roles um in financial services that ultimately led me to uh to, to take me the to, to name, no name about a year ago was your transition out of the military quite easy into the security field um no it it, it took a while i think the um the, the the first thing is back in about you know 2010 2011 um, you know, there, there weren't a lot of people in cybersecurity and, and not, not a lot of people with like an intelligence background. So um, it gave me the chance to, to uh, you know, to, to, to have a job, of course, because commercial companies were starting their first cybersecurity teams. And so that was a great opportunity. Um, but there was a there was a, you know, probably a two or three year period where I had to really recalibrate what I was focused on. Because when you, you move from a, a, an organization focused on national security or you know, mission focused, um, to a company that's focused on, for example, anti-fraud or brand and reputation perspective. Um, certainly, it took some time for me to sort of recalibrate my telemetry to focus on the commercial world. Yeah, nice. I see a lot of people do come from the military into the security field, so it's quite a nice transition for somebody. Okay, cool. So obviously, after leaving the military, got into more of the corporate side of things. When did you actually land your first sort of, how did it go from leaving the military all the way to becoming a CISO at your first financial service business? What was the sort of trajectory from there? Um, well, I joined an IT department uh, in Target. And so I worked in an enterprise architecture in Target for, for several years. Uh, and then this, this a role came open that was, you know, focused on security. And, and with my background, it was a, a really natural fit. So then I started working for Target's corporate security program. Um, and that kind of got me back into the, the, the security world. And I had this uh, unusual um, um, luxury and I, I, I met a girl. Um, and so that, that girl decided to go to med school. Uh, and so I decided to follow her. And so uh, uh, over the last... Um, probably 12 years since I met my, who's now my wife. Um, during that 12 years, I think I've made four job changes. And each of those changes has been really related to her change in, in medical school, fellowship, residency, permanent position. So I, I sort of follow suit. Wherever she goes, I follow along. Uh, and that has uh, uh, really worked well for me in my career is to, uh, is to let the wife drive the, um, uh, <laughs> the career that. car. So yeah, love that. Okay, so you you've got you owe her a lot then by the sounds of I it. Do. Yep. So what the the first CISO role? Let's dive into that. Where was that? Um, uh, City National Bank um, in in Los Angeles, and I took a um, uh, I took a role. In, City National is a is sort of a super regional. Based, it's based in Los Angeles and California, New York, Florida are kind of its primary footprint. Um, but I, I took on a team of about um, about 20 when I joined. And, and over the course of a couple of years, it, it grew into a team of about 35 um, uh, security and, and risk personnel. So that was really my first role. And I, had a, I worked for an amazing CIO who um, who, who gave me the keys uh, to this this machine, uh, even though, of course, for the first you know 18 months, I'm most certainly faking it. Mm-hmm. to get through uh, the learning curve in my first CISO role. But um, I think I think after after some time, I'm getting some adapting to the to the role. 
did, I, did having a, a supportive leader help in that position? It, it's existential. Um, mm-hmm. to have a, a little bit of latitude to to make some mistakes. So, I mean, taking having mistakes made that re- result in data breaches is one thing, but there's a, other mistakes. There's a, there's a myriad of mistakes. For example, like projects that just run long, or um, you know, you know, hiring talent and and getting to to getting to read the chemistry of the team and bringing aboard the right people that that really um, you know blend well. Um, those are the kinds of things that I just really had to work out for myself as a, as a leader how to get those. Um, um, a, a, a great example would be the the table manners that you have with an auditor or a regulator. That's the kind of thing that just takes time to practice and start to learn to get good at. Yeah. Also, so with, without without top cover um, uh, from a from a boss who believes in you, that's a that's a very tough that's a very tough role to to, to foresee being successful in. Got it. Got it. So after that first CISO role, where did you head after that? Um, I, I actually took a, I, I was a stay at home dad after that. Um, okay. My wife and I had twins. And so, um, and so she was in the middle of her residency. So it was really only the only option on the table for us was for me to, to aside from work. So I stayed home for a year and uh, for the, my, our, our twins first year. Um, and, and during that time period, uh, probably about six or six months or so, I started to get a little antsy to get back to, to, to work. So, um, uh, it was, a, it was COVID had started. So uh, okay. I got a chance to, to, to accept the role at Penny Mac, which is a mortgage company in Los Angeles. Yep. How long did you spend that? Uh, about a year and a half total. Yep. Okay, cool. And then this and then, Yeah. As the company was really going back to, um, um, kind of like a return to office posture, um, I was living in Minnesota. A lot of the team was in California. Uh, their their whole company really positioned to move back into office regionally um, made a ton of sense, and so that was really the you know kind of the juncture where it made sense for me to to depart. and And I, I had the really uh, lucky privilege too of, of of handing the CISO role over to um, my deputy at the time, who we've worked together for many years. And uh, Cyrus was really. Um, uh, about a planned transition that way. So nice. the, the 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 planning of a transition is is extremely valuable when you depart the role. So I, I did get a chance to plan both City National and Penny Mac um, as a as a planned departure. Okay, great. And then how did the 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 CISO role at No Name come about then? Well, we had been a um, um, uh, kind of an early early adopter. I I I'd, I'd known the founders since they started, and so I kind of kept tabs on No Name really in its in its early design period. Mm-hmm. Um, and then ultimately, when they they came, came out with the software, um, I was just thrilled with how how amazing the early like the early version was. Um, so we became a, a pretty early customer, and uh, and having had the having had my head in this problem set of APIs for a while, APIs and banking are, are not new, um, but having struggled with this for a while, when I got to a point of success with No Name, um, I could envision like. This is a problem that I can solve, um, and and so the problem set itself was really difficult. I had a, this company built this platform that was fantastic at it, and there was just good chemistry with the leadership team. So it was a, it was a nice transition um, yep. last summer to to move over to No Name. Got there. How does your role differ of being a CISO at large enterprise and then going to a, a cybersecurity startup? Technically, everything is the same in terms of being a, a security practitioner. Um, Protecting a network and end users and customers and data with all of the same rules, like the f- physics of protection, all apply. The the primary difference is that along the way of just being a being an employee, um, there are things that a startup does not have that a big company has. Like so, for example, there's we don't have like a huge team of um, um, retirements and benefits specialists. Here's just one person. Um, we don't have a whole team of like SharePoint or Jira administrators to lean into. You just have to do it yourself. So as you go th- through your workday of being an employee and a security practitioner, um, there's no point in time where you really, everything you do, you have to sort of self-service. And if there's something missing, you just have to go fix it. You have to go find it. You have to go fish for it. You have to go uh, be much more resourceful because um, there, there there aren't big back office departments to rely on. By, by the way, this is a, you know, like 
finance and HR and facilities. These are you know teams that I've been accustomed to having uh, um, in my corporate world. Um, yeah. I, I I I regret not appreciating all of those teams more because when you have to self service everything, um, or like there's one person in the company who handles you know background checks. If that person is is on vacation for a week, um, you know you have to self service, and so that's that's the big difference I think. Yeah, yeah. So how big a, a no name now and talk to me about what they're actually doing and what the problem that, that they're solving is. Yeah, we're about uh, about 300 people now um, across the globe. And and our, our software comes in a couple different um, kind of components and modules. Um, but we're looking at the API uh, as the as really it's the centerpiece of, of applications today and in the future. And so as an application, an API really is its own set. Um, an asset has a life cycle. Um, so, for example, when we were looking at APIs five years ago, um, we think about them as, as as something that needed to be penetration tested before going live. That's 100% true. Um, but we have to look more expansively at the API. So we have part of our platform is for developers and, and security teams to test APIs during, develop, during development. There's yep. testing, there's posture and hygiene of the APIs in production. There's runtime defense to uh, identify when an API is being uh, attacked or, or abused. Uh, and then there's the, the last mile of, of looking out there in the wild for things like API keys and documentation out there in the public internet. So when you take an expansive view of APIs, um, you look at it as, as, a, as a asset all by it with its own life cycle. And so our technology is focused on really being the, the centerpiece for a security team of handling all those functions across the API life cycle. Got it. Got it. I read that um, Gartner had said that it was going to be the number one attack vector for 2022. Did that come into fruition? Was that is that correct? Um, yeah. So not, not everybody has the same like tech footprint. So like from company to company, uh, let's say for the sake of, of discussion, you've got one company um, that has a, a massive IT footprint, but a relatively low count of APIs. Um, mm -hmm. API attacks might not be particularly dominant for them. Um, and then on the other hand, you have companies on the extreme side, like a, a SaaS company or a, a new tech startup or a, um, an online bank, certainly, um, where the API itself is its business critical asset. It has, has all the transactional data. And so for those organizations, attacking their APIs is overwhelmingly the most important attack to defend against. So it's really a continuum. Um, all industry verticals really do have um, API utilization and exposure, um, but there are some companies that are really kind of coming into their, you know, they're growing into that right now as they, as they um, you know, modernize their infrastructure and applications. Got it. I uh, listened to another one of your podcasts and you spoke about shifting security left within yep. API security. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, shifting left is uh, shift left is, is is real because when we look at the the software that we're building as as organizations, the more that we can put the hands of security controls in the hands of the people developing code, um, the 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 more efficient it is to build secure software. So, for example, um, if if a developer can find a security bug or a defect you know, in their command line while they're while they're coding, um, that's a dramatically more efficient place and time to find a security problem than it is if we if we have a third party come in and do a, a penetration test on that system that's already in production. Um, it costs a lot of time and a lot of money to fix a security problem once that system has sort of moved into its 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 um, like its production state. Um, yeah. So yeah. you just have a dramatically more efficient. Um, um, security program, if you can maximize the developer's information on security vulnerabilities right there in the moment they're coding. What about the posture management piece of it that you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, po posture management is a kind of a new word for a, an old th old thing. And that, that, that thing is it's asset management, which is know all of your assets. Uh, number two, uh, configuration management, which is you, you have the asset, is it configured well? An API is an example of that would be something like we have an API and it's it's supposed to be an internal network facing API, but it's also addressable from the external public internet. That's a misconfiguration. Um, and then the third thing would be like vulnerability management. So let's say, for example, that the, the API has been developed with a, an authentication policy that's weak. Um, that would be a vulnerability. So um, asset config vulnerability, it's posture management um, and for APIs, because they're custom software, um, you really can't use 
technologies like um, like a volume scanner that we use to scan our network or a cloud cluster management that that evaluates our, our cloud infrastructure. APIs are usually invisible with those technologies. So to have posture management for APIs really requires like sort of like a, a unique lens to see the API and to evaluate its posture. Got it. Okay, cool, cool. Let's talk about some of your sort of venture advisory stuff that you do. So I noticed that you're part of Cyberstarts and a couple of other bits. How do you get involved in that? Um, I, I think about seven or eight years ago, um, uh, just having the opportunity to um, sort of luck into meeting a couple of companies that were, you know, born born in Israel and uh, and were um, you know developing some really interesting technologies. Um, when a company is so young, they're very sort of thirsty for feedback. Um, and so, as a as a buyer, I was happy to do so because what what it gave me as a buyer is it gave me the number one. It usually got like preferential pricing. That's just a sort of an obvious one. Uh, because you're willing to take to, you know, take a leap with with a new company, um, but also you get feature requests very quickly. So, for example, um, you know I have a technology that I kind of like the technology, but I really need it to integrate with ServiceNow. Um, when you're an early customer, um, your requirements get built into the platform really quickly. So, um, I, I sort of found that as an to be an advantage to my company was to be an early adopter and then shape the forms um, with you know functions and features that really fit what I needed. Um, and that just sort of snowballed into um, more and more opportunities to engage with early stage companies, um, eventually with Cyberstarts and, and with um, Wild Ventures um, joining in, in an advisory capacity. So I really get to talk to all of the companies as they're going through their very, very early development. And usually it's just looking at things like the competitive landscape, um, looking at um, how does the product fit the need of the security team today? Uh, and then, then every once in a while, it turns into something more significant, like a customer relationship. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I think I'm seeing a lot of um, CISOs that are keen to get into this. So just wondered how you particularly done that. What's your role with the Wall Street Journal? Is that some sort of authoring or editing you're doing? What, what are you doing there? I saw that on your LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, with, well, with Wall Street Journal and with uh, CNBC, um, both of those um, media organizations have essentially a CIO advisory council. Uh, so that's a couple of different times a year. There'll be opportunities for like professional networking events. Last last week was in Silicon Valley. There's a whole group of uh, of uh, you know um, large corporate. CIOs who came in and shared their stories on digital transformation or on how they uh, think about, um, let's say, generative AI, for example, is a great mm -hmm. topic. So you get to really, you know, be a party to a lot of discussions with some really um, thoughtful uh, CIOs. And then periodically, then when the, when the journal or the, the CNBC is looking for like subject matter um expertise, then they'll reach out to the members for, for input or feedback. Uh, like, for example, for CNBC, um, you know, they had a, a council that was decided to do like a ransomware exercise. And so there's a hundred people on the council, but the roughly six or seven of us that are cybersecurity focused, we get to be the, you know, we, we moderated the ransomware simulation. That's the yeah. kind of thing. There's a lot of give and take um, just for professional knowledge. Yeah. Amazing. I've got to ask, how do you keep up with doing all of this stuff? Twins, C CISO role, advisory work, journal work. Um, uh, so if you, if, if I, if you, if you think I'm keeping up and that's very generous of you, um, it's a, it's an avalanche. I mean, a, a startup life is, um, um, you know, goes through that roller coaster of, of, um, of, you know, 5 AM meetings and, and with Tel Aviv and, and, and late night, um, sessions for everything. So it, it just, I think it's focusing on personal productivity. Um, for me, it's like, like small things like agonizing over my calendar and all of my messaging platforms because there's 14 of them uh, and, and all having it laid out in different monitors and then um, you know just just praying that the weather holds by the way uh, I live in Minnesota and it was just a couple of weeks ago um, where we got like three feet of snow and so for four days um, we were essentially stuck inside I couldn't get out of my driveway um, so for four days I would like kids and dogs, everybody's stuck inside. Um, and so every once in a while, like that, that week broke, um, everything broke that week. Uh, so it, it isn't, it isn't particularly smooth when yeah. there's 
kids and dogs and, and snow involved. Um, but m- most of the time it works out for me. No, I love that. And what, what, let's wrap this up. What, what advice would you give to, to somebody that is on their track to CISO and is thinking about maybe going from corporate to a, a startup? Um, I think the, the, the primary thing that I'd, I'd be like looking for, um, would be to work with organizations, whether it's a customer, whether it's an advisor, and ultimately, of course, as an employee, um, look for organizations that you would work for for free if you had the opportunity to. Um, don't tell anybody that. Um, but I, I think if a person goes in um, trying to identify a job based on compensation um, or identifying a job based on, let's say, it's the title or the profile, um, that that kind of uh, that doesn't create stickiness. It's not rewarding. Um, what is rewarding is is when you can work with a company that you 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 enjoy working with the people you you like the mission or you love the technology um, and uh, that internally you could you could say to yourself I would do this job for free if I say I won the lottery I would still do that job uh, that's the job you want um, because that's the job that's gonna you know you're gonna get up at five in the morning or be up till midnight and traveling um, away from home uh, it'll keep you going when you have a sense of um, um, of commitment to what the company's doing. Amazing. Carl, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you, Joseph.